Something to unlike. Days ahead of testimony before Congress, Facebook apologizes after blocking a Catholic college's ad. Civil war in Syria. President Trump and his advisors publicly disagree over the role of the U.S. military. A lot on her plate. Part two of my interview with Lydia Bastianich, a celebrity chef, best-selling author, and Catholic. And an amazing feat. Orthodox Christians in the Holy Land celebrate their Holy Thursday. On EWTN News Nightly for Thursday, April 5th, 2018. Good evening from Washington, D.C., and thank you to those of you joining us from around the world for news from a Catholic perspective. I'm Lauren Ashburn. The Trump administration calls for an end to immigration policies allowing unaccompanied migrant children to stay in the U.S. The White House says tens of thousands of children enter the U.S. illegally, but very few are removed. The president's aides defend their stance despite concern from Catholic bishops. White House correspondent Mark Irons reports. Good evening, Mark. Good evening, Lauren. I just talked to Mercedes Schlapp. She's the White House Director of Strategic Communications and a practicing Catholic. She tells me legal loopholes hurt efforts to enforce immigration laws. This is a process of just ensuring, again, that we have a legal, orderly immigration system uh, and that our ICE agents have the authority to be able to, if they feel these individuals shouldn't stay in this country and they go through the process, um, to be able to have an expedited removal. Schlapp says the administration is not targeting children. A migration expert with the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops says many of these children are fleeing violence in their homeland. They are targeted because they're young because they're vulnerable, because many times they're poor, and they are fleeing for their lives. There also needs to be a more demonstrated commitment by the administration to look at root causes and look at development and aid programs in these home countries that would help ensure that these children don't have to flee. Feasley told me one of the reasons Catholic bishops are concerned is because they have personally ministered to many of these children. We'll see if the bishop's plea impacts the president. In addition to closing loopholes, he wants to end catch and release. The president believes illegal immigrants should be locked up after they've been arrested so they don't skip out on their court date. Lauren. Mark, are we learning any more details about the president's plan to send the National Guard to the southern border? When I spoke with Mercedes Schlapp today, she said this is an issue of national security, but gave no further details at this time. Meanwhile, a bishop near the border is speaking out. The Diocese of El Paso is calling this decision to send the National Guard morally irresponsible. Lauren. All right. White House correspondent Mark Irons, thank you. A top aide to Environmental Protection Agency Administrator Scott Pruitt is resigning. Samantha Dravis, the Associate Administrator of the EPA's Office of Policy, is considered to be one of his closest aides. A source familiar with the decision says Dravis resigned because she wanted to work in the private sector. Facebook apologizes to a Catholic college for rejecting an ad featuring a cross. It comes amid more bad news for the social media giant. CEO Mark Zuckerberg admits most users should assume their public profile has been scraped by third parties. Correspondent Jason Calvi joins us from Capitol Hill as lawmakers are preparing to grill Zuckerberg next week. Good evening, Jason. Good evening, Lauren. As you know, Facebook is everywhere, on your computer, on your phone, and soon right here on Capitol Hill, lawmakers are asking, how do you tame a corporate giant the size of Facebook? The questions come as Mark Zuckerberg, the CEO, prepares to testify next week in both the House and Senate. It's over a massive privacy scandal. Facebook admits an outside company got a hold of private information from up to 87 million users. Now its CEO is taking the blame. We didn't take a broad enough view of what our responsibility is, and, and that was a huge mistake. And it, was, it was my mistake. The latest scandal involves Cambridge Analytica, a political consulting firm linked to the Trump campaign. The company is accused of abusing the consent of thousands of people to gain the information of millions more. Using a, basically a third party app, and these apps uh, until a few years ago had the ability to scrape an enormous amount of data, um, not just about the people who were using the app, but also about their friends. Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg promises to do better to protect privacy. 
we have to ensure that all those developers protect people's information too. But it's not just privacy concerns that are hurting Facebook's image. Catholics are outraged after the social media company rejected this ad from Franciscan University of Steubenville, writing, Your image, video thumbnail, or video can't contain shocking, sensational, or excessively violent content. A school spokesman says the image is completely appropriate. Crucifixion is gory. It's horrific. And Christ was beaten to within an inch of his life, scourged. Um, and the, on the San Damiano cross, he doesn't exhibit any of that, just a little bit of blood on his hands and his side. You couldn't even see his feet in this image. So that the fact that they indicated that this image exhibited excessive violence, it was shocking and sensational, was, was itself shocking to me. Facebook has since allowed the ad and apologized, calling the rejection a mistake. We haven't heard back from Facebook, but they did tell Fox News that they approve millions of ads a week and sometimes they just make mistakes. Facebook in 2017 spent more than $13 million lobbying, partly to ward off regulations. Now, Republicans here pride themselves on slashing regulations, so it's really questionable if Congress or the Trump administration will actually try to rein in Facebook. Lauren? Well, if they do, when he testifies on Capitol Hill next week, what can Congress do to protect people's privacy. One proposal is called the Honest Ads Act, and it's sponsored by 18 Democrats and Republican John McCain. In part, it calls for Facebook and other companies to reveal from what country political ads come, but that doesn't deal with privacy. That deals with, with advertising. Thank you so much. Capitol Hill correspondent Jason Calvi. Top Pentagon officials continue to plan for the future of the U.S. military presence in Syria. This comes as President Trump calls for all American troops to be pulled out within six months. Still, the military says there is no timeline to dial it back. Correspondent Wyatt Goolsby joins us with a response from the Pentagon. Good evening, Wyatt. Good evening, Lauren. Officials here have been trying to clear up the confusion today. They say the U.S. goal in Syria has not changed. The focus is still to defeat ISIS. So President Trump as, says as soon as that's over, he wants American troops out. So today, one of the top Pentagon officials, General Kenneth McKenzie, laid out exactly what would need to happen before the military considered ISIS truly defeated. I think it's too simple to think about just reaching in state in Syria. I would, but I would go on to say that our definition of success against ISIS would be they are unable to generate successful attacks against the homeland of the United States or against our allies, and they're able to be kept at a uh, kept below the noise level by a combination of local police and security elements wherever those localities are globally, not just in the Euphrates River Valley. McKinsey and Pentagon spokesperson Dana White say the U.S. is winning the fight against ISIS, but the war is still far from over. Right now, there are 2,000 American troops in Syria, and they're helping Syrian Kurdish groups and other allies in the eastern part of the country. It's important to remember that the United States has endorsed the coalition's presence in Syria and its goal to defeat ISIS before it reemerges. So members of the President Trump's national security team strongly urge the commander in chief not to pull U.S. troops out too quickly and possibly risk ISIS reemerging. So reports indicate, though, that the president still wants American troops to eventually return home. Lauren. Wyatt, let's go back to the humanitarian piece of this. The U.N. and aid groups like Caritas say the crisis has led to one of the worst humanitarian crises on the planet. So how is the United States helping Syrians in that capacity? Well, Lauren, unfortunately, in the last few months, it's been difficult for the U.S. and other charitable groups like Caritas to have to reach Syrians, specifically in and around Damascus and those suburbs we've been reporting on. The Syrian government, led by President Bashar Assad, has been hammering those cities and suburbs uh, for, for months now. And they say they've been targeting rebel groups. But as a result, it's there have been hundreds of innocent people who have died and hundreds more who have fled the region. In total, though, the U.S. and USAID say they've provided $7.7 .7 billion dollars to Syria since the Syrian civil war began seven years ago. Now, some of that has gone to the most obvious things, food, water, shelter, as you can imagine, but also hundreds of million dollars, dollars are also going towards sanitation, education, and agriculture. Lauren. One billion dollars for every year of the war. Thank you so much. Correspondent White Goolsby reporting from the That's Pentagon. Right. Turkey's deputy prime minister says the country is using secret operations to arrest citizens with alleged links to the 2016 failed coup. 
The news comes after Turkey arranged for the deportation of six men from Kosovo who are accused of supporting the coup. The move angered Kosovo's prime minister and drew sharp criticism from human rights groups. At home, Turkey has arrested more than 38,000 people for their alleged links to the attempted overthrow of the government. The poisoned daughter of a former Russian spy says she is recovering. But a hospital in the U.K. says her father, who also fell ill from a nerve agent, remains in critical condition. Britain has blamed Russia for the attack in Salisbury, England. Russia denies any involvement. The country also protests being locked out of the investigation. Relations between Russia and the rest of the world continue to deteriorate. Three buses are seen leaving the U.S. Embassy in Moscow today after Russia expelled 60 American diplomats. The move is in response to Washington evicting the same number of Russian officials from the U.S. Politicians in Italy spend a second day trying to form a coalition to govern the country. The meetings come after elections last month failed to give control to a single party. One official says it's just the beginning of, quote, a long and tortuous process. A cardinal in France and a high-ranking monsignor from the Vatican will appear in court early next week. They are among seven people accused of covering up a child sex abuse scandal in Lyon. Cardinal Philippe Barberon says mistakes were made, but denies the allegations. Pope Francis says he is praying for a toddler in England whose parents have lost a legal battle to keep him on life support. Alfie Evans suffers from an undiagnosed degenerative condition. He is in a semi-vegetative state in a hospital. Here's the tweet from the Pope. It is my sincere hope that everything necessary may be done in order to continue compassionately accompanying little Alfie Evans and that the deep suffering of his parents may be heard. I am praying for Alfie, for his family, and for all who are involved. It is possible the toddler might be taken off life support tomorrow. Is it possible for Protestant spouses of Catholics living in Germany to receive communion under specific circumstances. Seven German bishops want to know. They are appealing to the Vatican to clarify a recent decision by the German Bishops Conference. At the end of February, a majority of those bishops approved pastoral guidelines that would make it possible for Protestant spouses of Catholics to receive communion under specific circumstances. But not everybody's happy. This decision has sparked a major controversy in Germany. Vatican correspondent Juliet Lindley joins us from Rome. Juliet, what do the proposed pastoral guidelines say about communion for Protestant spouses? Essentially, it says that a German Protestant who is married to a Catholic can take the Eucharist on condition that he or she has uh, made a careful examination of conscience with a priest, has affirmed faith to the Catholic Church, uh, wishes to end serious spiritual distress, and has a longing to satisfy a hunger for the Eucharist. But they're Protestants. So what are the seven German bishops asking, and who is this letter addressed to? So they've addressed this urgent appeal to the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith and to the F Pontifical Council for Christian Unity. And what these seven bishops, who are mainly from Bavaria, what they are saying is that, uh, that the proposals, that the guidelines um, contradict Catholic doctrine. They undermine Christian unity and they exceed the competences of the bishop's conference. So that means that the head of the German bishops must have a response to that letter. So the president of the Bishop's Camp Conference, Cardinal Reinhard Marx, who is also the Archbishop of Munich and Freising, has written defending the guidelines, defending the decision. He's written to the German bishops and he says that they are consistent with the theological and ecumenical texts and they are consistent with canon law. And he says that they are a result of Pope Francis's efforts to um, further steps in ecumenism, he writes. So now, Lauren, uh, German Catholics, I guess, are eagerly awaiting to see whether the Holy See, whether the Vatican is actually going to weigh in at some point on this. Okay, it's in the Vatican's court. Juliette Lindley, EWTN News Nightly Vatican correspondent, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Lauren. An American seminarian who carried the cross in the Pope's Easter Mass this past Sunday in Rome has died. <laughs>
brother Anthony Freeman, a Louisiana native, was found dead in his room. He is believed to have died from natural causes. Brother Freeman was set to be ordained a deacon in June. In a statement, Father John Connor, territorial director of the Regnum Christi Seminary, says in part, quote, I ask you to pray for the eternal repose of the soul of Brother Anthony, as well as for his parents, Brian and Debbie, and family members, that they may receive strength and comfort in this difficult time. Coming up, Grace Before Meals. Celebrity chef Lydia Bastianich tells us about food, family, and her Catholic faith. And Flying Eucharist? A church in Brazil is criticized. We'll tell you why. Celebrity chef Lydia Bastianich influences millions of home cooks. Her story is a rags to riches one, from simple farm girl to international culinary mogul. In her PBS series, Lydia's Kitchen, the beloved chef mixes food with her stories of her growing up in Italy and her love of family. In part two of our interview, she opens up about her faith and her journey from running from communists in Yugoslavia to cooking for not one, but two popes. People know you as a famous chef, but what they may not know is your devotion to your Catholic faith. It's interesting because when I was just born and raised, I was raised under communism. And under communism, we were not allowed to practice. So uh, my religious upbringing, if you will, at a very early age was uh, almost uh, nascosto, was hidden. And my grandmother would sit with my brother and I on the stoops by the open fire, and she would tell us stories uh, uh, about the Bible, about and to take us to church, and would teach us prayers. And then when we ultimately escaped, and uh, went to back to Italy. There I entered uh, Canossiane, the, the nuns uh, Canossiane, uh, the school, and there I really got to embrace and understand my fate. And so it was at, at 10 years old, I really full, uh, kind of wholeheartedly felt free to understand and practice the faith, and I carried it ever since. There was a nun who was very important in your life. There was. Her name was Lydia, oddly enough, like me, and she took me under her wing and brought me into the school. And also, you know, being an immigrant, because we escaped at 10 years old in a school, new, new friends and all that, new kids, you kind of feel ill at ease. Well, she kind of nestled me right in with the friends, with the religion, and she followed me for the whole two years that we were, because when we went, uh, escaped, into Italy uh, in, uh, in 1956. We ended up in a political refugee camp. And from there, I would go to school and to church. And Catholic Relief Services helped you. Absolutely. The Catholic Church, the Vatican, uh, took it, I think, upon themselves to, to really resettle a lot of those uh, immigrants. Not unlike today, it's happening today as well. From Catholic Relief Services to cooking for two popes. Cooking for the two popes, I was nervous in the planning and all of that. But once you begin to do what you love and for some something that you do love, it becomes kind of easy. And uh, I always say, you know, food is the ultimate equalizer. When you sit at the table with somebody, you know, you kind of become one. Which pope liked your cooking better? They both seemed very happy when they <laughs> left the table, you know. <laughs> okay. As a chef, I look at the dishes, and they, the dishes seemed pretty clean when they came back. <laughs> What did you make, Pope Benedict? You know, Pope Benedict uh, is, of course, German. And I did a little research. You know, his mother was a chef. So I said, hmm, he must have had good food. I made some risotto, I made some pasta, but I made also sauerkraut. I made goulash for him. I made apple strudel for him. I brought out all those, those kind of German flavors. The first night was very proper because, of course, it was the first night. He had his guests, the cardinals. But the next night was his birthday and what was the anniversary of his papacy. And so we did a, a big uh, a cake with the Midas on top. We brought it out, helped him cut the cake, we sang, and it was really wonderful. It was, I felt so close. I felt like family. You also cooked for Pope number two. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Francis. You know, I didn't believe it could be real that I get asked to cook for, for the second pope and certainly for Pope Francis. I said, well, you know, he's Italian, he's from Piemonte. 
his grandparents. And so I made a lot of risottos for him. He loved that veal, light veal, a whole beautiful roasted fish. Now, we would do lunch and dinner. He would come home for lunch. This particular day, he took a rest. And us, the staff, were in the kitchen. All of a sudden, the Secret Service went, the Pope, the Pope! And all of a sudden, he appears, you know, in his white gown with his, with his skull cap. He was looking at us. We were having a coffee. Posso avere un café con voi? Can I have a coffee with you? I mean, you know, what are you going to say? <laughs> we offered him a seat, whatever. He didn't want a seat. He stayed with us for about 20 minutes, uh, had a cup of coffee with us, and talked to each one of us. And when he finished, he went into his pocket and pulled out rosary beads, blessed each one of the workers, and gave to each one of them a set of the beads. It was just, just a, 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 I mean, you know, extraordinary. Doesn't get any better than that. It certainly doesn't. My thanks to Lydia Bastianich. Tonight on EWTN's Pro-Life Weekly, host Catherine Hadro talks to a former Disney World princess who got an abortion to keep her job and now regrets the decision. I ended up quitting the job that I loved. I loved Disney. And I ended up breaking up with the guy that I thought I was trying to keep from this abortion. And then a few months after that, I just wanted to die. The interview comes after a recent tweet was sent and then deleted by Planned Parenthood affiliate in Pennsylvania looking for a Disney princess to get an abortion. You can watch the entire interview at 10 p.m. Eastern tonight. Visit EWTN.com for more airings. Up next, Garden Party. The Vatican unveils a new statue of a 10th century saint. And it's Holy Week for Orthodox Christians. Thousands of fans gather in Philadelphia to celebrate the Villanova University Wildcats. The team won the men's college basketball tournament earlier this week. Villanova classes were canceled today, so fans at the Roman Catholic University could take part. It's their second national title in three seasons. The keynote speaker at an event for the 50th anniversary of the papal letter Humanae Vitae says that the author, Blessed Pope Paul VI, would not be surprised by the hashtag MeToo movement. Philadelphia Archbishop Charles Sheffew says the encyclical warned of negative effects if birth control became widespread, saying it would lead to sexual diseases and the exploitation of women. For more on what the Archbishop says about blessed Pope Paul VI predictions, please visit catholicnewsagency.com. A medieval Lutheran cathedral in Sweden will host its first Catholic mass since the Reformation around 500 years ago. Vatican Media reports the cathedral is in Lund in southern Sweden and it's opening its doors to a Catholic parish undergoing re renovations. The first mass will be in October and it will be used every Sunday for several months. A new statue from Armenia has arrived to the Vatican Gardens. It's of St. Gregory of Narek, a 10th century monk and poet. The Armenian ambassador says the saint is a bridge between the Armenian church and Catholics. We are very grateful to Pope Francis for this recognition of imp uh, historical important in international culture of San Gregorio of Narek and all Armenian uh, and all Armenian theology role of Armenian theology. Leaders from the Armenian Church and the Pope took part in the statue's inauguration and blessing. In 2015, Francis named Gregory the 36th Doctor of the Church. Orthodox Christians in the Holy Land and around the world are celebrating Easter this weekend. At the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, the Greek Orthodox Patriarch leads the traditional washing of the feet. The Holy Thursday tradition symbolizes Jesus doing the same for his disciples at the Last Supper. Holy Flying Communion. A Catholic church in the Archdiocese of Sorocaba in Brazil is in hot water for its unconventional presenting of the gifts. Take a look. Yes, indeedy, that is a drone. On Easter Sunday, the congregation cheers and applauds as that monstrance containing the sacred host is suspended from a drone 
and flown down the nave to the priest. The Catholic Herald in England says one priest is calling it sacrilegious silliness. Others on social media say it's stupid, scandalous, and a profanation. <laughs> All I have to say is, can you imagine if that had dropped? Tell us what you think about this. Sacrilege or a way to involve the congregation? Let me know online. Follow me at Lauren Ashburn on Twitter and at Lauren Ashburn EWTN on Facebook. For all of us here at EWTN News Nightly, to all of you around the world, thank you for watching. I'm Lauren Ashburn. Good night and God bless.